So here are three things that I have learned about the left over the past couple of years. Um, and, I, and I think they go, since this is a conference about nationalism, they might help explain the resistance to nationalism. It wouldn't seem obvious that there would be much. There's nothing inherently wrong with nationalism. In fact, it should be the default setting for a nation, right? I mean, <laughs> by definition. <laughs> um, but there are, as you well know, and if there weren't, this conference wouldn't be occurring, um, there are powerful forces who are opposed to it. And so the, the question, which is too rarely asked, is sort of why? Um, and I'm not sure I have an answer, but here are three observations that help, might help fill in the blanks. Um, the first and the most shocking to me is, and this is something that I've, I've said like 30 times on my show, but every time I say it, it's like I'm, I'm bewildered that I'm saying it. Um, the main threat to your ability to live your life as you choose does not come from the government anymore, but comes from the private sector. I, I, I can't believe I'm saying that. As someone who really grew up in this city, my father worked for the government, was engaged day to day in fighting the Cold War. And maybe because of that, I was trained from the youngest age, from a pup, to believe that the threats to liberty came from government, of course, because the Soviet Union was our model. You know, the force that was clamping down was, you know, darkening half of the world and crushing religious expression and the market was a government, the Soviet government and, and all the satellites in China. Um, and so it really took a huge amount of evidence wagging right in my face, not being the brightest person in D.C., to realize that in 2019, the threat to the things that I want to do and the things that I want to say, the threat to my conscience, to the ability to believe what I choose to believe, and that's the fundamental right, that those threats really come primarily from companies and not from the federal government. And this even now is a controversial statement. I'm sure there are libertarians, well, libertarians already hate me. Um, it's requited, trust me. Uh, but um, even non-libertarian conservatives almost can't form the words because they've been trained for so long not to believe that, but the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. And not just in sort of the, the small annoying ways, the fact that America's most popular cookie, the Oreo, now has you know, a statement of you know, gender politics on it. Well, I'm, I'm not joking. I would need reading glasses to, to read it, but apparently, since I'm 50, apparently all new Oreos have the question, you know, What's your pronoun? So, you know, this is the kind of story that cable news thrives on. It'll be like, oh, that's so annoying. They're so crazy. Take three steps back. What's actually happening? A large American company is committing a pretty brazen act of propaganda aimed at your kids. And the message is that the binary gender scheme, which we were taught in biology class in seventh grade, is no longer operative. This is basically a kind of profound statement against nature. And you have to kind of ask yourself, like, is the federal government doing that? No. Mondelez is doing that. Oreo is doing that. Multiply that times every Fortune 500 company in America, 500, and you have the state of play. The coercive, okay, so to which libertarians will say, well, I mean, yeah, but if you don't like it, start your own Oreo company. <laughs> okay. I guess. And we can argue, or, you know, go Nilla Wafer or whatever. There's no sort of way to imprint messages on a Nilla Wafer. Get it, okay? <laughs> but that's not really <laughs> an operative option in a world of monopoly power. And I know that, I think Arthur Millick is speaking later on this, maybe Oren Cash, but probably a bunch of people are going to address this in much deeper detail and much more capably than I'm going to now. But let me just say, you can't create your own Google. And if you have a company, and we do, through which all human information in English flows, through a choke point that you know, we can't control, there's no democratic way of controlling, you have the potential, well, first of all, you have more power vested in a smaller number of hands than at any time in American history, A. And that itself is ominous and should make all of us, like. Cast aside 
any kind of ideology or theology or whatever, just look at that straight in the face. Are you comfortable with that? You shouldn't be. Of course you're not comfortable with it. It's terrifying. Let's stop lying to ourselves. It's awful, all right? And that's where we are. But think through for five minutes the potential risks, the threats from that, and they're really obvious. It's like they could make whole ideas disappear. And in fact, there's some evidence that they're working to do that. And as Orwell noted, once you take away the words, you take away people's ability to think about the concepts, right? You, you, you can't have an idea if you don't have the words to express it. And so the person in charge of the words really has the power over your mind, and they do. And the pushback from our elected officials has been basically zero. Now, I'm not gonna go on a long Jeremiah about why, I think you know why, because they're corrupt. Literally, the antitrust think tank in Washington takes money from Google. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, and, and it has a name, something like, it's a very literal name, it's like antitrust think tank. <laughs> and if you go through their list of donors, yeah, Google's on there. So that doesn't seem to bother anyone on the left. Well, why? Because they're benefiting from J.D. Vance, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm so nearsighted that people loom out of the darkness at me. Uh, that doesn't bother anyone on the left, of course, because these are the shock troops for their politics, of course, because they're in alliance with the progressive left. It should bother people on the right, but it doesn't because, again, their minds are captive to an antiquated way of looking at the world the build your own Google way. So I just think, it, it, again, this is something that I could go on about to the point where you'd ask me to stop, but I would just, I, I would stop on this point. Ponder this, retrain your mind to acknowledge the things that are right in front of you that are obvious. It's one of the upsides, there are many downsides I will say to Trump, but one of the upsides is the Trump election was so shocking, so unlikely. So we elected Donald Trump president, huh? I, we all pretend, oh, of course we did. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> it was so shocking that it did cause some significant percentage of people to say, wait a second, if that can happen, like, what else is true? In other words, like, if the Loch Ness Monster is real, what about the Yeti? <laughs> I'm serious. The weirdly, the Trump election spurred in me a kind of reassessment of UFOs. We've done a consistent series. No, I'm not. I'm serious. And it turns out like they're real. It had never occurred to me. I spent my entire life making fun of people who had unauthorized thoughts. I thought I was a free thinker. You know, as all you know, young people flatter themselves. You know, of course, almost all fascists are under 30, in case you haven't noticed. And it's especially true in the press corps. And they think of themselves as as really sort of the, you know, the cutting edge, you know, I'm willing to, I'm radical. And that's why if you think something you're not allowed to think, I'll punch you in the face. <laughs> right, well, I, you know, all young people, the truth is, are a kind of variety of that, including me. And the beauty of Trump was, once he showed up, you're like, huh, okay. Well, so this happened, I guess I can think whatever I want. So maybe it's time to traipse up to the mental attic and see what's in storage. And you, what you realized, what I realized was there was all this junk up there, moldering, that I'd assumed was still sort of fresh and bright and worth keeping. You really accumulate all kinds of ideas, most of which aren't actually ideas, they're just ticks. <laughs> and you don't realize that you have them. And Trump really, and it wasn't, of course, just me, but it was, it was a lot of people, almost all of them were in this room, actually, <laughs> who went up there and they're like, huh, you know, if, well, it, is it still true? And so what I encourage myself to do every single day, this is one thing I am faithful about, is I really encourage myself to just try to look clearly, like, what is actually happening? I mean, the, the forces of lying have definitely increased. They've gotten louder anyway. It's like everyone's lying, it's all propaganda. So disregard all of it, put your earphones on to white noise and just look around 
And who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? I'm serious. And a lot of the people we've been told are good guys are not at all. Actually, they're, some of them are the worst guys. I'll let you figure out who. Um, sorry, Whew, I got carried away. Okay, so that's the first observation. The second um, observation I would make is, that, and I'll be short with this, but it's, it's another one of my obsessions, is that it's all a kind of Freudian projection. Like, whatever they say you're doing is precisely what they're doing. And again, because I'm not a super genius, it took a long time to figure this out. And I really think Antifa was maybe the moment where I figured it out. It's the guys who are literally armed with steel bars and they have black masks on are calling other people fascist. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, so of course you go immediately to the cliche, that's Orwellian. No, actually it's Freudian. <laughs> it really is. The things I fear about myself, I transfer onto you. And once you understand that, it really is the Rosetta Stone for their behavior, amazingly. It's true for virtually everything. And if you're me, the most, I mean, specifically me, the most bewildering of all is you're a racist. You're a racist, which it's like, you know, I wake up, I open my door to get the paper. You're a racist. <laughs> and I guess at this point, I, I guess I probably just admit it. But I actually not. And I make the opposite, I make an affirmative case against racism like all the time on my show. Or for less race consciousness anyway. It's, it's such a boring subject, it's such a dead end. It can't be fixed, it can't be changed. No, I'm, I'm serious, so it's not even that interesting. It's not interesting to me anyway. It's not the, the America that I grew up in. I'm not being self-righteous about it. I'm not saying I'm above any, I'm above nothing, trust me. One of the things you realize as you age is that you really are pretty loathsome. <laughs> you know? As my father, this is vulgar, excuse me, my father, all, who was a genuinely wise man, I had dinner with him last night. He always used to say, when we were little, I mean like third grade, my brother, I mean, always said, boys, the root of all wisdom is knowing what an asshole you are. <laughs> Gee, pop! <laughs> he would always say that. And it was only in middle age that I realized totally how true that was. So I'm not in any case, I'm not getting up and be like, I'm really not a racist. Okay, please spare me. What I'm just saying is it's amazing that the people who are so focused on the subject of race are the ones who are denouncing everyone else as racist. And then you realize it's not amazing because it's true of literally everything they say because it's not actually a matter of trying to convince you of their program. It really is a very specific and recognizable psychological syndrome, right? It's, I mean, I remember the day that Bill Crystal, of all people, called me a racist, and I was like, really? Bill Crystal? And I was, oh, of course, <laughs> of course. It fits, anyway, um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then I guess the last point I would make, which is worth brooding about, um, is that, and I don't want to believe this, and I, by the way, I hope I'm wrong, and perhaps I am, um, but from where I stand right now, it seems pretty clear to me that they're not interested in peaceful coexistence. And by temperament, you know, I, I just reject that. I really am liberal. I am I'm literally an Episcopalian. Um, still practicing, amazingly. Um, but I am liberal by temperament. It would never occur to me to choose my friends by their political beliefs. It would just, it would just never occur to me, ever. Nor would it ever occur to me to try to control someone, as much as I despise libertarians, and I really, really do, I mean that. I, I also kind of am one. I mean, I am functionally in a lot of ways libertarian. I'm just not that interested in other people doing their weird thing. Go crazy. It's just how I feel. I probably shouldn't feel that way, but I do. They don't feel that way. They don't. So if you were, and someday I'm going to do this if I have time. It'd be interesting to go down to like the most remote county in Alabama and interview just a cross-section of people at the Hardee's 
just 25 people, and ask them what, a, what they think of the personal sexual practices of the residents of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, <laughs> and B, how often they think of it. <laughs> how much of your disk space does this occupy? How many hours a week, estimated, do you spend seething about what they're doing in the sack? 1,500 miles from here. And I'm pretty sure you would find right around zero people would even understand the question. <laughs> it, just, it just wouldn't compute. Brooklyn, huh? I don't know. Probably something weird, right? Yep, something weird, for sure. <laughs> All right. That's in New York City, right? Yep, well, there you go. Would you like to pass a law to prevent them from doing that weird stuff? Huh? Who are you anyway? No. And I mean people, I mean all of them elders at the local Antioch Baptist Church. I mean evangelicals, 100%. And they would tell you, no. And then of course, you know, you know the second half. Go to Williamsburg. And I said, what do you think of the people of, you know, Dothan County, Alabama? You know that over 50% of them are against gay marriage. What? I was just thinking about that this morning. We should kill them. <laughs> they lay awake at night thinking that somewhere in this country there is somebody who's not fully on board with the program. And by on board with the program, I don't just mean is disobeying. I don't mean a county clerk is refusing, refusing to sign a marriage certificate. You know, that's a real argument. I get, I get it no matter what side you're on. No, they mean someone who in his heart secretly is traipsing down to the basement after dinner and communicating by shortwave with someone else who disagrees. <laughs> and that's unacceptable. And we're gonna root that person out and we're gonna fix that person. In fact, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna re-educate that person. Ah, yes, these impulses are universal. Yes, they are. There's a reason that happened. Because this is an evangelical faith, is what I'm saying. The progressive faith is an evangelical faith. It's a proselytizing faith. And that's exactly what it is. And, and, of course, and you know why. I can see there are religious people in this. Of course you know why. Because you can't, you know, you can remove religion, but you can't remove the religious impulse. Because it's inborn. It's innate. It can't, it can't be taken out. So it'll just be redirected to something even. Do you think the resurrection's implausible? <laughs> Let me tell you about woke politics. <laughs> Not only is it way more destructive, it's like 100% dumber, okay? But that's what it is. It's just a replacement, obviously. But we should keep that in mind. And by we, I'm not even sure who I'm talking about. I don't know, I don't, I don't even, and I hope if this conference accomplishes anything, it's to explain what it means to be conservative or nationalist. I don't even know, I've lost track. But whatever they're for, I'm against that. That's kind of how I'm thinking of it right now. I'm, I'm absolutely against that. And I'm also, and I'll stop with this, I'm also prone, and I bet many of you are the same, I'm prone to lie to myself about it. And I just want to be absolutely clear because I know there's a TV camera there. I want to be really clear. I'm still for living with people I disagree with. I will always be for that. I will always be for pluralism. I will always be for intellectual diversity, always. I'll always be happy to have dinner with someone who doesn't share my views. My only point is, and that will never change, I will not allow that to change because I think you become something less than you should be. Young here, people say the news is full of lies. Some Kennedy's motorcade. 239 people. Death of Jeffrey Epstein.